Good morning. It's great to be opening the session. My name is Ganesh Kesari. I'm a co-founder and head of analytics at Gramna. At Gramna, we tell stories from data. We use analytics to identify unusual, useful insights. And with the help of information design, we convert these insights into engaging and actionable data stories. We work with about 100 plus clients, and we help them embrace data, apply analytics, and adopt it as part of their day-to-day -day business. And me, personally, I'm passionate about making data science simple for everyone. I write articles and speak in conferences to explain AI in simple English. And that's exactly what I'll be doing today. How many of you are able to identify this blue bird or the Hollywood blockbusters inspired by it? There have been two movies. Okay. If you've heard of Rio, pretty popular movies. Adorable blue macaw, that's a bird here. A few months back, this bird went extinct in the wild. It's tragic that such a beautiful species can no longer be found in the forests. And this is not an isolated incident. Every year, hundreds of species are going extinct from our planet. And extinction is not new. It's been happening for millennia. But what is shocking and unusual is the pace of extinction now. Now it's thousands of times faster than it what used to happen earlier. And we are not surprisingly in the sixth mass extinction of our planet and the worst one since the age of dinosaurs. So the question is, how can we stop this? What can we do to reverse the trend? Surprisingly, technology and data science have been playing a revolutionary role in conservation in the recent years. We'll talk about some case studies from this line of work. I'll talk about the, the work we have done with Microsoft. Microsoft AI for Earth has $50 million in grants for NGOs and researchers to help apply artificial intelligence for environmental conservation. They work in the areas of climate change, agriculture, biodiversity, and water. So there are four stages to protecting animal species. We look at one by one and a case study for each. Stage one is to detect and, and find out the presence of animals around us. For decades, researchers and environmentalists have been placing camera traps in the forests. The intent is to, uh, is to detect them in their natural habitat. The camera traps don't always work the way we expect them to. Check this out. So on a more serious note, these are actual camera trap pictures from the forests. About 75% of these pictures don't have an animal in them. Due to wind, there's movement of the trees, and the sensor gets activated, and, and a burst of shots are taken. And there are others where the lighting is not proper, or the animal is too close, or there are technical exposure issues with the camera. As a result, it's a huge effort to identify those pictures which have any animal in them. This was a challenge which was put out in the open by iWildCam. They shared about 150,000 images from camera traps and said, can anyone build a model to detect animals? We resorted to deep learning to solve this problem. A quick show of hands. How many of you are familiar with deep learning here? Okay about half of you. So for the benefit of others, I'll take a quick minute to introduce the concept of deep learning and the intuition behind it. While deep learning falls under the broad umbrella of machine learning, there's one significant difference. If I were to build an application to detect my face, if, how would I do it with traditional machine learning? I would first identify those features which I think are important, the eyes, nose, ears, hair or the lack of it, and uh, pass it to the model and let it extract these very same features for every picture presented and do a match feature by feature. And that's how traditional machine learning works. Whereas with deep learning, we simplify it further. We just provide the series of pictures, my mug shots, label my name, saying these are the pictures of Ganesh Kesari. Now let the model go figure out. 
So identify what are those features which the model thinks is most important to distinguish faces. It may not be the eyes or nose. It may be, uh, say, the, how flat the forehead is or the curvature of the nose or even some other feature which is so subtle that we may not notice. And that's how deep learning identifies the features and distinguishes images or videos. And it's found to be pretty effective. The accuracy is way out of the ballpark. And it's actually getting close to how accurate humans are. Coming to think of it, this is not very different from how we teach our children. So how do we get them started with identifying animals? We show a series of flashcards, and we show labels and explain that this is uh, the elephant, this is, an, this is a rhino, and we repeat it a few times. And then the kid is able to identify the animal in any setting, as a toy, on the billboard, or in the forest. And that's pretty much how deep learning works. It automatically identifies features and extracts patterns from images, videos, and audio clippings. So we implemented a deep learning network to detect animals from the camera trap images. We showed the 100,000 odd images to the model. In this case, we chose a model architecture of ResNet 50. And with some model engineering and tweaks, the model is able to identify the animals, detect them first. So this model is actually in the process of being rolled out as a public API. And it will soon be available for researchers around the world to freely use it with their camera trap images. And incidentally, this was also a Kaggle challenge put out by iWildCam. And this solution stood third in the leaderboard. Stage two, after we detect the presence of any animal, is to actually identify the species. So we were working with a conservation group in Washington called the Nisqually River Foundation to monitor and identify species of salmon. Why salmon? Once upon a time in the Pacific Northwest, the rivers were so full of wild salmon that the fishermen liked to say that they could cross the river on the fish back. But now, close to half of this population has vanished. So this foundation has set up technology to monitor the species. And how do we identify salmon species? Well, unfortunately, some people may not be able to identify salmon even if it hit them in the face. Check this out. So, so the Nisk Valley Foundation had set up these camera traps underwater at the narrow points and rivers. So there were two sensors. Once the, river, once the fish crosses the first sensor, the video gets activated, and it captures a continuous shot until the fish crosses the second sensor. So these videos are anywhere from 15 seconds to 60 seconds, depending on whether the fish is enjoying the selfie or it's really shy of cameras. So we had thousands of such videos, and these are actual snapshots. And we had to identify 12 species by building an AI model. So we went about building the model, and we chose YOLO V3, uh, which is pretty smart and efficient. And just as we started showing these frames to the model, the model started identifying almost every single fish. The accuracy shot up to almost 100%. In spite of our creative bias, this looked too good to be true. So we knew something was going wrong. And then we realized that the model actually was learning the background. If you notice the pictures here, each species was found incidentally in certain kinds of water. So the model was actually learning the background and not the fish themselves. So we had to fix this process. And we had detection and then classification as a two-stage process to solve this problem. And eventually, YOLO V3 gave us an accuracy of about 78%. And this is a snapshot of the model in action. Here you can see the model has identified the species to be steelhead salmon. And what's remarkable is that even when a portion of the fish body is visible, it's able to identify it. So that's identification of salmon. Now, after we've detected and identified the species, we need to count them. In the natural setting, animals don't come in conveniently sequenced. Most species don't. They appear together as a bunch, as a crowd. So we need to count crowds. The Antarctic ecosystem is in serious risk. 
researchers have been trying to study the impact on penguins which are at the top of the food chain. So these are challenges due to climate change and other human interventions. So they needed the help of technology to collect the data because though there was intuition that something was going wrong, they didn't have the data. So how do we use technology to save the penguins? <clears throat> so not just this guy, but the entire bunch. So Penguin Watch is an initiative by Oxford University. About 10 years back, they set up camera traps in Antarctica. They set up uh, these 100 camera traps in several locations, and they started capturing time-lapse pictures every hour. So across 10 years, we have rich footage and millions of pictures available. But the challenge is you need to label the pictures first so that the model can start identifying the penguins. It's a, it's a massive task. So to solve that, there was a crowdsourced labeling initiative which was launched. On the Penguin Watch website, they called for volunteers to come from across the world to, to identify the penguins by placing markers. This is how it works. Once you get into the website, there's a quick tutorial which says that you will have to place markers on the penguins, the adults and the chicks. In case you're not able to identify any uh, penguins or the image is hazy, skip them. If you can identify animals, other animals or humans, mark them with a separate marker. So once you go about this, you can quickly place markers on each image, submit, and you get done. And thanks to this effort, hundreds of thousands of images have been neatly labeled and were readily available for training the AI model. So now that we have the data and we have it labeled, the next stage is choosing the model approach. While deep learning model is the go-to choice here as well, what we have seen so far are models which use bonding boxes. They are good to identify those images where you have these entities clearly visible. Say you have a head which is visible, but it doesn't work quite well for counting crowds. Why? There are people at the front who naturally hide those at the back the problem of occlusion. And there are different portions in the picture where the density is different. So some portions you can count them manually, and some portions they are closely huddled together. And there's this perspective distortion. Faces in the front look much bigger compared to those at the back. And camera angle could be a killer. What is, whatever is a frontal shot looks very different from a top-down one. So that's where density estimates are pretty useful. So there are deep learning models which use density approximations. They split the image into different portions and identify the density in each section. And then the counts are localized and added together for the entire image. So this way, we are able to handle all of these challenges we have seen, and we are no longer looking for heads in the image. And what works with crowds of people, we found was equally effective with counting penguins, crowds of penguins. So we used a cascaded CNN as a model, and it had uh, two stages. Firstly, the image is split into a three by three grid. So you have nine patches, and each patch passes through these two stages. Stage one is a high level crude approximation done by the model. And then the model passes to the second stage where it does the density approximation comes, with, comes up with a more accurate estimate for that patch. And then all of these are added together to come up with a total count, and this count has been found to be pretty close to actual numbers. When we ran it on penguin populations, these are the results. So you can see a low density image at the top where there are five, five penguins and the model is able to count them. The second one has 46. The model gets an exact count in this case, but the mean absolute error for us was about close to 10, which was pretty good and close to published papers. So now researchers have a way to identify the sh change in penguin populations over the decade. So we've seen how to detect, identify, and classify animals, but we need to do something to protect them. So how do you bring in a real-time intervention? Today, every 15 minutes, an elephant is killed in Africa. And at this rate, in just about 10 years, they may go extinct. So there are several foundations around the world which are working solely to conserve elephants. And the attempt is to make them uh, safe so that our children can continue to enjoy their company. So they're quite adorable. 
So a quick, quick quiz for you, a second one. Can you spot the elephants here? If yes, how many? That's fine, any estimate is okay. Eight. Okay, yeah, eight. That's a pretty good estimate. Any other guesses? Okay. We'll find out what the model says. So this is an actual image from aerial shot from Save the Elephant Foundation. So they fly light aircraft, which takes a series of pictures across the entire African landscape. And the intent is to identify threats to elephants here. So we go about a similar process of model building to identify, detect, and count the elephants. But there was one challenge we faced here. We didn't have enough images. We had just about 100 images which were labeled and good to use. And we've seen that deep learning needs tons and tons of data. So 100 is not a starter. So how do you solve this problem? We used transfer learning. And how does transfer learning work? If you go back to our elementary school days, how did we learn our first language? We learned alphabets, we learned words, we learned sentences, and we, we learned grammar to string them all together. It took a few years. But when we had to learn our second language, did it take as much effort? We were able to use the first language as a crutch to compare the alphabets, words, and all of these. And we were able to transfer the learning from language one to language two. And given the similarity of deep learning to humans, the same technique could be applied here. So when you don't have enough images of elephants in the wild, you find out where you have elephants in captivity or maybe on Google. So if you're able to pull out hundreds of thousands of images of any elephant, you can start showing them to the model so that it learns how and what an elephant looks like. And then you show these 100 images as a learning on top of that so that it is able to quickly adapt. We tried the same thing and it worked. So here's what the model identifies, and you're right, it's eight, and the model is able to identify the eight uh, elephants in the image. So while this is a work in progress for us, there was a foundation called Lindbergh Foundation which has gone a step to complete the protection loop. They've deployed drones in Africa which does a similar job of identifying aerial shots. And additionally, they also identify threats of poaching potential poachers or human movement. And then they try and predict the movement of humans to see when and where they might intercept the animals. And this intelligence is related to the rangers so that they can get to the place even before the poachers can. Imagine the kind of deterrent this can be. And this has effectively brought down the killings in the forest wherever this pilot was implemented. And this is a great way to scale and replicate this pilot around the world. So we've seen the four stages to protecting animals. Now that you've heard the story, you can join the revolution. You can share your pictures. There are apps like iNaturalist, which let you upload and share it with the community. And there are also uh, organizations like Wildbook, which use AI to crawl the social media and YouTube, and they identify pictures uploaded by tourists and they identify animals uniquely within that. And the intent is to catalog them so that we can build a live census of animals to monitor the health of populations. You can find out how often a particular animal is appearing and so on. So your pictures can be very useful, not just the selfies, but your vacation pictures of animals can be pretty handy. You could also contribute by annotating. We have seen that AI needs labeled images. You can spend a few minutes of your time to label and annotate the images so that we give this intelligence to models. And thirdly, spread the word. As data science practitioners, it's a matter of pride that a technology within our reach is saving the world. So do spread the word and make sure people are aware of it and leverage all of these public APIs and models which are readily out there, which can be used at will. I'll close the session with six takeaways from implementation of deep learning in these projects. And they equally apply to enterprise implementations of deep learning as well. In the age of big data, identifying the right data is a massive task. You can connect to the fire hose of data, but finding what is relevant for you can be several weeks or even months of effort. 
plan for it because that is a first hurdle almost every project faces. We've seen that AI model need lots of data and lots of labeled data. So do budget time for labeling it because organizations assume that they have the data in warehouses or lakes and they can be readily used. But labeling is a important precondition which people often miss out. Thirdly, and an important point is just because you have a percentage performance me metric, you don't have to shoot for 100 percentage. A lot of projects start with conversations of accuracy and end right there. So you need to educate people that a good starting point is at the level of accuracy of humans. It could be 70, 75 percentage, but from day one, you get a huge productivity and scale benefit. And over time, models start getting smarter. A related point is it's not a question of AI versus humans. You need to design so that models take human inputs whenever they, have, they are low on confidence. So a successful AI system must keep humans in the loop. Gartner says that 85% of projects fail in the AI space. And how do you avoid this fate? Plan for the natural workflow of users and build your AI solution into the workflow of the users so that they don't have to come out of the way to use your solution and plug the results back into their natural workflow. And finally, refresh and upkeep of maintenance uh, of models is important. People mistakenly assume that models trained once stay smart forever. Any intelligence needs periodic training refresh. Budget, time, effort, and money for it. That brings us to the end of the presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. If there are any questions, I think I have a couple of minutes to take them. OK, we'll do that. Any questions? So the question is, how do you choose the spots to place the sensors? Because animals move all the time. For instance, in penguins, where do you place them? Uh, in the case of a salmon, we saw that there was this narrow river points which were uh, chosen so that all fish move through that, and you can sequence them. In the case of penguins, they were uh, strategically chosen points at different locations because penguins have a natural pattern of movement. So they were trying to cover most points where they would stay at different parts of the year because these are fixed cameras. And additionally, they currently Penguin Watch is also trying out satellite imagery where they have images right from the top so that this challenge of placing a particular, placing in a location is avoided. And even from satellite imagery like we have seen with aerial imagery, high resolution satellite imagery are also good enough to identify and count animals. Yeah. What kind of data rates were you working with uh, the, you're talking about the tools to train them? Yeah, data rates, like with respect to their, for the three models there, how much data was needed okay. for the training? Okay, so the question is how much data was needed for the training? Uh, the, the first one, um, camera traffic, we had about 150,000 images, 130,000 was the training data. And for Salmon, we had uh, a few thousands of videos, which was a little close, but uh, we could barely manage that. And uh, that the third case, we talked about uh, transfer learning with the elephants. And with penguins, we had, uh, I think, hardly about, about 200, 300,000 images. So most of those cases, it's at least 10,000 or 100,000 images which are needed to train. Any other questions? Okay, so the question is, how do you deduplicate the counts of animals uh, when you're picking it from social media? Uh, AI is smart enough that it can identify animals uniquely. So each animal has a unique fingerprint. For instance, whale sharks have a pattern of spots which no other whale shark has. So you can, with this, AI models are uniquely identifying animals. So from every sighting, they're able to tell whether it is a new sighting or a repeat sighting. So every animal, like a giraffe or a leopard, all of these have unique fingerprints. Okay, 
I think uh, that's uh, the end of the session. So please do rate, your, rate the session. Thank you.